we're in this session on uh, transforming your data warehouse for agility and scale, sponsored by Vertica. And I'd like to introduce our first speaker, John O'Brien, who is the principal advisor and CEO with Radiant Advisors uh, out there in Colorado. And he's got the mountains behind him, I see. <laughs> Uh, and John's going to be talking to us today about delivering cloud data architecture with agile processes. So, John, why don't you go ahead and do unmute yourself. There, there we go. go. I, so I have uh -oh. to do that manually. So thanks, Mary D. <laughs> um, let me go ahead and screen share my presentation. And we'll get going here. I'm going to take the first part of the, this hour and kind of share really uh, the work that Radiant Advisors and, and what I've been doing for the last several years with our clients. So a lot of the presentation today comes from our advisory services engagements, helping uh, clients, uh, you know, working on our methodologies uh, coupled with our research. So we uh, do industry research. We're also industry analysts for that completely um, vendor neutral objective point of view. But, you know, the real world is that a lot of uh, all companies have technologies and products. So we get to touch and, and help with all of them. Today, I am going to focus on delivering cloud data architecture with agile processes. And we have been doing cloud architecture and cloud, um, you know, migration strategies or adoption strategies um, for companies for years now. Um, in all three of clouds, from you know AWS, Azure, and uh, GCP. But one of the challenges we've seen in the last year or two are those companies, and perhaps you're familiar with this, that um, IT runs with, um, you know, agile product teams. Uh, these agile delivery teams uh, use JIRA, they're in sprints. Um, while it's great to have an architecture and, and a roadmap, which you know we help with and we do workshops at these clients for to get them going, how does that really fit into the agile process with something that was uh, a struggle? So, and number two, what we found was the fact that um, cloud uh, is offering something very unique and different um, in this process. So I'm going to share with you some of our best practices and some of the lessons learned from our client engagements. And hopefully that'll uh, help you, you know, maybe take a step back and look at uh, what you're doing and, and maybe some of the challenges um, that you uh, need to tackle. So let's switch. Uh, this is just a little bit about myself. Uh, just real quick, Radiant Advisors is an independent, which means uh, vendor neutral, research and advisory firm specializing in assessing and building strategies. Most of our work is helping companies with you know, their ongoing strategy um, that is really for modernizing both their data and analytics platforms. And today, um, modernizing analytics and all of that uh, takes center stage. Cloud is a strategy within that. So um, that's where we specialize and, and have for many years now. now Personally, uh, let's just say I've got over 30 years experience of building warehouses, BI, analytics, streaming, you name it. Um, I have been the you know, lead architect at companies. I've been a CTO of a, a vendor in the database MPP space. That's how I know Vertica so well. Uh, I didn't work there, but uh, they were my competition 10 years ago. Um, and I've been an industry analyst now for nearly 10 years as well. Um, and we're at conferences and events like Data Summit. So, it gives us a unique perspective. That's the main point here is that um, we're hands-on. Um, we can roll up our sleeves. We can get in there because we're practitioners. We also talk to all the vendors and we understand their products, strengths, weaknesses, and strategies. And we also engage with clients, helping them, but also seeing firsthand what's really working and not working and, and where the gaps are. Um, that's where we focus. What is it that companies need to help them be successful in their strategies? So that's my background real fast. Um, so today, what I wanna do is I'm gonna focus on, on three major points. Um, number one is agile architecture delivery. Um, agile architecture, um, evolutionary architecture. Um, to me, this is not a new concept, um, but for a lot of people, there is a mind sh uh, shift 
change that we need to make when we're saying, hey, we come up with our roadmap, it's our vision, it's our you know three to five year plan, and that's what we do. And what I want to say is it's nice to, to create that vision and, and build out your data and analytic strategy, but you really have to take architecture in an ongoing, continuously upgrading kind of aspect. One of the keys that we have found in this last year is a concept that we're starting uh, with many of our clients that is an architecture patterns book. So architecture patterns um, is one of the things that aids in an agile delivery process, but it really is what has helped us with the agile de delivery and development process as well. Another thing you might be struggling with, and this is why I want to touch on it, is what is the corresponding organizational strategy for something like this? Now, if you're a small team, and, and obviously organizational changes are not the easiest thing to come by, um, it understand, helps you understand roles and responsibilities, whether or not you're wearing multiple hats or you have other teams that uh, you can lean on. So that's what I want to talk about this morning is uh, let's start off first with what is agile architecture? And how do you deliver architecture in an agile fashion? So I'm starting out with this slide because this is our analytics conceptual framework. So for us, um, as a conceptual architecture, um, one of the things we make sure we are anchored in architecture, and this is for uh, architecture priorities, is to say, what is the analytics capability we're trying to deliver in the company. So it's a little different than a product uh, or a project because when you're saying, hey, we've got to get this data into this report with these calculations or we need to develop a, you know, a machine learning model that can tackle this complex and, and offer us some uh, probabilistic outputs. Um, what we're talking about is if you can break it down and look at your projects and say, what are the analytic capabilities that are involved? You get this spectrum that goes from left to right. And I'd like to start off with the left-hand side just to say, you know, in our world, uh, what we see and believe is that business intelligence, data warehousing, reporting, OLAP is not going away. It serves a purpose within the business that is what I consider operational performance management as a company that is operating, that is executing, you set goals, you have metrics, you work to achieve those goals. And running the company um, hasn't changed, nor is it going away. Now, what we do find is that this new um, middle um, section is, we call it enterprise self-service data analytics. Um, we also consider this business data enablement which means that we're looking at enabling the business to work with data because they're gonna have discovery, insights, validate things that help a, a data warehouse project, um, but also take care of themselves and maybe other teams don't need to get involved. Uh, it doesn't need to be a project per se. So we wanna focus on that capability because in itself, it adds a lot of value um, to the business as well. Um, everybody's ability to connect to data, find data, trust data, you know, follow a modern analytics life cycle, which is one of our methodologies, means that you have increased productivity of working with data. And then our, our third key spectrum, if you will, if the left-hand side follows the, the classic industry terminology of saying descriptive and diagnostic analytics, saying looking at what's happened and understanding how that might have happened, um, the left hand, the right hand side is more into the predictive analytics and prescriptive analytics world where we shift from here's the data and what happened yesterday happened to here's what we think is going to happen today, next month, in the next minute. And so here what we have to do is we leverage a different set of technologies, uh, but we deliver a capability to the business to predict or to solve complex uh, decision-making uh, routines that are, frankly are just too hard to try to business real code on the BI side. So here we have, let's focus on machine learning, but AI is to include uh, you know, all the deep learning routines you could have, neural networks, data science statistics, right? Because you're looking for patterns in the data or you're looking for prediction and prediction comes with probabilities. 
there's a 65% chance it's going to rain today. Business question, do I need an umbrella, right? In so that is a capability we want to deliver to the business. Now, what is the foundation for this? The horizontal lines on the bottom here is that there needs to be a common enterprise data lake, all the enterprise data assets in one place. So you can build as many data warehouses, data hubs, uh, things that support you know, both uh, cloud OLAP or uh, cloud BI that allows uh, self-service people to find data, work with data, uh, create what they need, curate that data, and where data scientists uh, you know, can work with those same self-service analytics uh, folks to go into the data lake, find everything they need, upload their own data. Some of it will be uh, streaming data pipelines into this and data pipelines will carry it further. But our foundation here is data. So the point here is that we have a conceptual architecture. We have a strategy that says our um, architecture for data and analytics will focus on delivering analytic capabilities. So as you're looking at projects, this is the first way to consider, hey, we've got a project. Do we need to get some self-service involved so that uh, we can explore the data, validate, is this even feasible? Does the business understand all of their requirements? And then we also have this second mode of, okay, now let's you know build the data models. Let's build the data pipelines and transformations. And so conceptually, that's how we can look at our agile projects and say, which components or capabilities do we need to have in the architecture available to enable a capability. Now, this slide is really intended to say there's a lot of components. If you're looking at a cloud, hybrid cloud, or multi-cloud architecture, you have new components in the data architecture side. For example, a data lake might be new for you. Data hubs uh, could be the breakdown of your data warehouses and data marts. Um, data labs are those uh, self-service analytic workbenches and even a data marketplace. Um, another term for data catalogs, right? So right there, there are four pieces of a new modern data architecture. Um, they all have their strengths. It's all built on polyglot persistence and other methodologies that you know you, you get to understand, but you set up your architecture and either way, you have components. You're gonna have integration components in the cloud you know, from data pipelines to streaming data hubs to data replication, orchestration is a big challenge uh, once we move to the cloud. So once again, if you're an on-prem BI team and building, even if you have a Hadoop cluster and, and a pretty sophisticated BI environment, moving to the cloud architecture, what is my SaaS uh, service offerings? What are my platform as a service offerings? How do I take advantage of elastic scalability, hybrid multi-cloud situations, or even serverless functions? All of that is, chances are, gonna be very new for you. Um, throw that on top of a mix of variety of database technologies, data management, because uh, data ops is continuing to gain traction and we're really uh, strengthening data governance and quality programs good to see data management is solid as part of your strategy. And then of course, you know, what does it mean to be in a data science platform? So that is a strategy in itself. So here from an architecture perspective, I've mapped out six different strategies at a high level that are going to be, you know, brought to your attention as you adopt and migrate to your cloud. So you want to move to the cloud quickly. Um, that's accepted. What my point is that there's a lot to do. So we have to break this down. We have to find a way to, we can't run off for a year and say, we're going to go build this and, and we'll come back in a year. What we have to do is we have to continue to deliver value to the business via our projects and inject architecture as part of that. So architecture is always going to be evolving. That's the new mindset, right? Speed, deliver something to the business the agile way is the most critical point, but then iteratively um, evolve that, improve that, refactor that. You know, One of the things that's hard for a lot of companies we've seen is um, building something that, hey, I should be building it a different way. It's like, well, let's take incremental steps that also build up your maturity and your proficiency with certain technologies. You know, I, I can look at a project and say, 
half of the components in here are new and you have no experience at other than you know what you've read and studied so nothing can replace that hands-on experience and we have to allow that in the architecture cost is going to be fixed um, so let's not you know worry about that too much you have so many teams you have so many resources um, you have only so much budget you can only absorb so much technology in that way but quality doesn't change anytime we deliver any small solution it is going to be a quality production worthy solution it's just that we need a shift in you know maintain our speed but shift our scope and refactor and increment and that's one of the main things that we're going to do with architecture here so the challenge or comments I, I make quite often at clients is resist the urge to over engineer the solution right um, your customer uh, doesn't care if your your analytics product um, how it was built um, how fancy you built it they just say did you meet the requirements I have so we want to keep things simple with the idea that we will evolve um, over time. The second point that um, I like to point out is don't have architecture solve problems that don't exist yet. Because there are situations where we're looking at a solution and say, yes, um, this is the right way to do it, but we could do it this other way. It's quicker. We get it to the business. We'll learn and see how it goes, but we can keep an eye on seeing if this situation actually happens down the road and we can make the adjustment there. So deliver the architecture and the components and the solution that meets the agile sprints or epics uh, needs. So here we're going to evaluate projects, you know, we're going to deliver them and then we are going to refactor them. They have architecture components in them. Refactoring is looking at an existing project and finding opportunistic based future needs and balancing the value with the sprints. So this is just a, a template, um, an example of moving data from a business initiation phase to data ingestion, prep, building your target data development models, data pipelines, publishing data, and your analytics team has to focus on these. And a sprint is going from left to right. Um, you know, we want to work on these. So when you take a project and look at this, you're like, well, how am I going to deliver our product? Um, over stages and over however many sprints. Uh, one of the main things that we look at is this business initiation, whoops, time that says from the moment ideation happens within the business, what about this? How fast can we get something in front of them to say, hey, let's keep doing that? That's called cycle lag, lag time within um, data ops, and it's one of the key metrics here. But the point I want to make is we saw teams getting into building up their data ingestion and using an architecture pattern for data ingestion. Let's say it was a, a Kafka streaming hub where we didn't have any experience with that or this team didn't have any experience with that. So setting it up took longer, figuring out in the cloud the connections, uh, working within the environments. And basically, it was the learning curve. So what we discovered is for each one of these areas in just in discovery development we had to identify within the sprint was hey you're doing something new here so let's take that out and let's make a sprint dedicated to building the pattern so build the pattern make the connections and a pattern could be the simple one piece of data endpoint to the other and just prove end to end that it works now that we have this pattern, we can put it into and you can predict your level of effort to implement this in production. And that's where the consistency, because what we would find is that we're going to develop something new. Let's say it's a managed gateway um, on AWS. So we can drop files there and they show up in our S3 data like buckets and then Lambda will kick off. Makes sense on paper. But when we put that in our sprint and then it carried over into the next sprint and carried over, Basically, what was causing that was learning curve within um, the cloud migration piece. So in order to support this moving better, you want to build these patterns and you want to dedicate sprints to building out a pattern, documenting the pattern, um, publishing and, and communicating it so that others can leverage that um, and also speed up their development. So this is an example of what you know some of the target architectures would look like um, at our clients and 
example here is AWS and some components also in here that are just representative and, and it's not endorsements. But you know, for a client, this is what we would say, we've got to tackle all of this. So how do we break this down? This is something that you have after a couple of years of working in an environment and developing all of these new skills. So what we would do is come back to our roadmap that's analytics capability based and link it to the agile business delivery. How are we delivering to the business? What is the capability? How do we refactor things? What component can we include? So this is just a quick example of, you know, the, the orange arrows here represent sprints. Um, if, you know, there's usually an initiative and you can set it up as an epic to modernize your data warehouse or BI platform to the cloud. So you can get into a, a cloud native uh, data warehouse, but within your overall architecture, you do wanna have streaming ingestion. You do wanna adopt data pipelines, which is new. Um, a data lake may or may not be new for you as well. How does S3 buckets or Azure blob store or ADSL work um, or Google storage? You know, what is your data integration look like now? Is it gonna be a platform as a service? We call that integration platforms as a service, variety of code tools, right? And then new data hubs. So you want to start small, but each one of these sprints breaks down an architecture component. We want to ingest data, you know, we want to set up our data lake uh, initial architecture. Um, you know, we want to do a data pipeline that can, you know, maybe the a good example here streaming data ingestion. It's nice for scalability, speed and all of that. But in delivering to the business, fetching the data and dropping it into your data lake with this pipeline might be the fastest one in the first iteration. Converting that to streaming pipelines might be in a future sprint as part of your refactoring. This, as you can see, simplifies what you're trying to achieve in your modern data warehouse initiative. Similarly, on the data science side, you have data science gateways, you have Spark clusters, people can be running on, on different VMs. Um, what nature of a Spark cluster do you want to use? Um, another piece that will come up in here as a, a big decision maker is, you know, where's your compute? You know, are you going to shift to ELT versus ETL? Are you going to have in database functions doing parts of your data science and machine learning routine? So once again, all of these, this architecture that takes, you know, maybe a year, and we've seen a year and 18 months um, as some of the data science programs we're helping right now evolve, and they are working out, they are learning, they're just making it work, and they are moving into their refactoring. We have a client now that's moving into the um, deployment scalability and efficiency and scalability phase of their data science program. So here again, we just focus on the flows and the components and we look for opportunities, but we tackle a new component as part of the sprint or a new pattern, right? How we wanna implement that separate in its own sprint so that we can do that and then work on the deploys later. So this leads me to one of the things that we realized is that's really beneficial at companies are architecture patterns and making them available. So what we try to do is we try to set up a, we call it an MVP because we like to joke around and call it a minimum viable pattern. But you know, how do I take data from this table and land it into my data lake? Is it CDC? Is it a fetch? Is it uh, you know, gonna process? Is it Lambda? Answer all of those questions about security and governance, but make the data set actually very small and show that you have one pattern, you know, streaming CDC, into a data lake or fetching from a, a, a software as a service API into your data lake. Um, so you find these little small points, you try to make them very thin point to point lines and that's your minimum viable pattern. And then we follow a, my favorite, nail it and then scale it. So nail it first, have this pattern documented, get others adopting your pattern, improving it, evolving it and then making it completely scalable. So pattern categories, just as an example for you, data ingestion, data processing, uh, data architecture, all of these are patterns that you treat opportunistically as you're aligning to the business value delivery projects. So these are patterns that you can say, 
um, hey, we need to do a, a micro batch or micro extract into our hub. How do we want to do this? You know, let's break down the data pipeline or data flow into smaller segments, and then let's prove that this one works solid, reliable. Um, and now it becomes a pattern that our agile delivery teams can leverage. Um, APIs throughout the architecture really increase the performance overall. So once again, we're talking dozens, if not hundreds of patterns, components, strategies that all need to be an ongoing evolution, but it's driven by the business uh, delivery. And here, I, I just thought it'd be fun to show, you know, this was my page out of uh, <coughs> our, our JIRA. Um, so within our JIRA tickets, I created an epic and a backlog for architecture. So each one of those different patterns we mentioned before, I assigned it the data and analytics platform, either a selection of a technology, you can see that technology evaluation template, uh, defining uh, different architecture migrations, um, but all micro things that became the backlog within the agile architecture epic. So, right, I load these tasks uh, to burn down. Um, we groom them weekly, um, as you do with JIRA. Um, and then I look at tasks that may also break out to cloud ops or IT ops. So here we take that you know, template and we make a little bit more generic. What we're talking about is what is the architecture track? I have my own epic now and I can get the different teams to work on it as part of their delivery, but they're gonna take a cycle out just like I can assign something to the cloud ops team. Business, analytic capabilities, delivery teams that have something to deliver and perhaps they pick up an architecture component and then there are complete architecture components that we need to build and deliver as business value. The business value will be that we produced a pattern ready to use for the delivery teams that speeds their deployment and you can quantify that. Here's what that would look like, right? Select a pattern. Does the pattern exist? No, create a sprint to go create that pattern and analyze and understand it. You can do this in a sprint, two week sprints. So in a two week sprint architecture, one of the things that I like to focus on are descriptions, right? So the format for me is, I would say very clearly, as a data and analytics platform architect, I want to so that the agile delivery teams benefit from this. I have clear acceptance criteria, including the communication of publishing this so that people become aware. Um, maybe it's posting to a Confluence page, um, scheduling a meeting to get feedback and reviews, um, you know, following up and working with the delivery teams as well. So these are um, projects and how we would manage architecture right, derived from the strategy into my own Epic and working with Agile delivery teams. So this can work with a, a lift and shift migration strategy, or this can also work with migration and cloud uh, native strategies. Now, I will, uh, we've been doing this long enough to say, if you can, we are really seeing more success with the lift and shift strategies. Um, there's a lift and shift, uh, we call that rehosting take up your current systems and just move them into the cloud. And without changing anything, you're going to learn a lot as is. Cloud native or optimized for the cloud involves the most amount of learning of cloud native techniques, cloud ops, CICD, microservices, containers, all of that. But that should be part of your strategy over time to develop that. So in the middle, some people joke and call it a lift and shift and tweak. But we call it a replatforming is you could go from your on prem that might be struggling um, technically and, and capacity wise into cloud platform as a service components, cloud data warehouses, cloud uh, based uh, integration services. And that introduces a medium in between where you're trying to minimize the amount of changes, but you still need to take advantage of some of the cloud benefits. The key here is I don't want you to simply have the mindset of we need to run on the cloud, I want you to realize the full benefits of the cloud over time by bringing in all of these sub technologies and strategies. So refactoring, fewest number of sprints, we've talked about this. 
this is similar to where I'm just focusing on sprint one, sprint two, showing data ingestion teams. If I am you know, having my way, I have an agile team dedicated to nothing but data ingestion, building patterns and deploying hundreds of data set ingestions in that platform layer for all the agile teams to build machine learning, modern data warehouses, self-service. That's my ideal, but that's an organizational thing. So I'm going to close with just one kind of concept here I want you to take away from an um, organizational strategy. When we look at one of the struggles with the agile delivery teams was that they were overloaded with too many roles. When you're moving to the cloud, your team or multiple teams trying to do the same thing where they become redundant is that they're trying to do architecture. They're trying to do data enablement with their customers. They're trying to do cloud operations, your CI, CD infrastructure as, a, as code deployments. So we had to break this up. If you're in a single team, have somebody dedicated or a role dedicated to the platform team, which is really enables agile delivery teams and their focus is on efficiency right in the agile process of the things that are getting developed reusability modularity new technology adoption evaluations the agile teams should be focused on speed and agility for delivering business value and anything we can take off their plate helps them do that that includes the platform operations so this is how are we monitoring things in production the big flip you'll see is machine learning flips everything to machine learning um, you know, uh, monitoring and operations. They want reliability. Have a person or figure out your interface and liaison to that team. And the same is data enablement, which is focused on the business users adopting and using what you do. You want your delivery team to continue to focus on data engineering and pipelines, but a separate team is helping the customers inside the business or externally leverage and start to use that and let them focus and dedicate it because one is customer facing and one is systems facing. So keep this in mind. This is actually another uh, structure. As you can see that this is probably the shortest version I can make for trying to compile days of workshop information. But these are the highlights for migrating to the cloud. And if you're trying to do that in a more agile way, these are the key mindsets that you want to keep in mind and drill into further. So. With that, um, I'm going to hand it off to uh, back to Mary D. And okay. let us continue. Go ahead. So thank you, John. That was great, as usual. Wonderful <laughs> condensation of a longer workshop into our time yes. constraints here. Normally what I do at the Data Summit, right? Well, so. you do. That is when back when we are able to go back to an in-person conference, John, then you can do that. Yeah. <laughs> I can hardly wait actually, but there it is. Oh, we're doing it virtually with clients. So uh, it does work. It, uh, it does it work. Just, it it's does a different work. approach. I this works, this is valuable. <laughs> yes, so um, this is just my email, of course. Data Summit has it all. If uh, you have any questions about what I talked about or would like to follow up with me directly, please feel free. But uh, I wanna hear uh, from Ocas now. Okay, I know he's so, got some exciting stuff to talk about. Absolutely. So I'd like to introduce our second speaker, Wakas Dillon, and he is the technical product manager for machine learning at Vertica. And he's going to be talking to us about scaling analytics workloads using distributed, distributed analytical data warehouse. So um, Dillon. You yeah, thanks, Mary. Uh, thanks, John. Uh, so I'll share my screen here and uh, yeah, just putting it in presentation mode. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thank you, Mary, again for the introduction. I am part of uh, Vertica product management team uh, for responsible for machine learning, Spark uh, integration, uh, complex layer types, uh, and a few other projects. Um, so a quick introduction on what is Vertica. It's um, you know a really uh, cool tool, data warehouse, uh, which leads a lot of, um, uh, it actually powers a lot of uh, the leading uh, data-driven companies in the world. So um, whether it's digital first, like Uber or Twitter, ad tech and media, content publishing, internet of things, you, you'll see Vertica embedded or um, directly uh, available in a lot of these applications and being used there. Uh, we have a lot of uh, OEMs that actually embed Vertica as part of their solution uh, uh, because of some of the benefits it provides. Um, and you would not probably know that uh, behind the scenes it is Vertica, the uh, analytical engine that's uh, uh, powering these applications 
uh, but that's uh, what you'd get. Uh, so overall, uh, again, going into what Vertica exactly is, it's uh, a SQL data warehouse, which is pretty easy to understand, uh, but it's also a query engine and an analytics and a machine learning package and all in the same uh, you know, data warehouse that you have, which is slightly different from uh, uh, competing uh, products. Uh, and it's sort of a unique uh, uh, differentiation in the market that uh, with, um, with the data warehouse, you get all the capabilities that you'd expect out of data warehouse, um, along with the fact that it's, uh, enabling you to do a hybrid uh, infrastructure. So you can have on-prem, you can have multiple cloud strategies. So you're not locked into a, a certain vendor or a certain cloud provider. Um, you have a lot of uh, choices there. And at the same time, you get a lot of analytics and machine learning built in. So it's really easy to put all um, that uh, cool technologies into production. So the secret sauce behind Vertica, uh, blazing fast analytics, we have native columnar storage. Uh, really high data compression rate um, and uh, a massively parallel processing database. So um, in terms of your analytics uh, workload, that's mean, uh, that means really high speed and scalability. Um, so why is really speed and scalability really needed? Um, if you look at the data that we have in the world, it, it is expected to grow tenfold by 2025. So let's say you have a solution right now and it's working fine for you. It's a, maybe a transactional system or some other system. Um, and it's, it's working fine for you today. Um, it doesn't mean that it's going to be good for your data needs of tomorrow. So if you want to start thinking about that, um, that's where you'd want to think of a solution um, like Vertica. Um, and when we talk specifically about analytics um, on some data that you have stored, because data storage is one thing, you have you know, a lot of data that's getting in and you're bringing it in and storing it, that, that you have a mechanism for that, that's all good. But until and unless you are able to analyze that data and analyze all of that data, uh, you're not really able to get that value out of it. So analytics and machine learning would, I would say, would be the real value out of that data. And once you're doing that, there are certain considerations that you want to have. So um, once uh, when you want to analyze this data, you want it to be at a reasonable speed, which is good enough for your business. And you can actually get insights from that data uh, on which you can actually uh, perform some actions. Uh, let's say you have a customer visiting your e-commerce website. You wouldn't want to be able to predict which uh, products to recommend to that customer after the customer has left your website. So that's uh, you know the, uh, just one example of where speed would be uh, really important. Secondly, when we're talking about uh, really large data sets, it's not easy to move them around between different tools. So if you have one tool for data storage, another tool for performing your analytics and you know having as a query engine, and yet another for machine learning, uh, this is a lot of tools that are talking to each other, which is probably fine in some smaller data sets, but once the data size grows, uh, it's not really feasible to uh, keep moving that big data around. Uh, so you want to have a solution which can um, help you avoid that. Uh, and finally, if you have a, a, a storage solution which can store all of your data, but your analytics solution because of memory limitations or some other limitation that it has, doesn't allow you to uh, use all of that data uh, for your analytics, that is going to compromise accuracy. Um, so you would ideally want a solution which can work with all of uh, your data. Um, again, in terms of uh, the architecture here, uh, going back to what John was saying, it's really important that when you're defining that architecture, you have all these considerations in mind and you uh, devise it uh, accordingly. Um, in very simple terms, we have you know, linear scaling, which can uh, keep on adding more memory, more CPU resources to a machine that you have, or you can have uh, horizontal scaling where you can actually keep on adding more and more nodes as your data size grows. So uh, that, that's exactly where uh, Vertica fits in. Uh, so just you know, tying that uh, connection. In terms of uh, machine learning, Vertica has um, uh, a lot of uh, available options. So we have a SQL front end. Most of uh, the functionality that you see uh, in um, database is actually built in uh, C++, and we have built a SQL front end on top of that. Um, we also have a Vertica Python API. Uh, you can build your own machine learning algorithms, uh, bring them to Vertica, and parallelize them on all of your data here. And two recent approaches that we have added uh, are TensorFlow model import and PMML model imported export. Uh, what that essentially uh, lets you do is that instead of having a separate tool where you would put your machine learning models and then have your you know, database in production talking to another system, you can actually build your model and bring that to be hosted in the data warehouse in a production system, which makes it really easy to put it into production uh, because the model, the analytics are actually coming to the data instead of the other way around, uh, which can uh, create a lot of problems. Uh, similarly, PMML is an open standard, so it lets you import those models. And sometimes some of our customers actually want to build a model in Vertica because let's say they have a hundred node uh, cluster on which there's a really large data set on which they built a model, which is really good. And now they want to export it to some edge device, for example, let's say 
Um, your company doesn't allow you to move data out of certain um, geographic regions in the world. And you want to push these more so those, those regions instead of bringing that data in. So uh, this approach really helps you with that. Uh, when we talk about Verticus machine learning, uh, we actually support the whole process, right from data ingestion, data analysis and understanding, all the way to deploying those models. Uh, model training, evaluation, all uh, are actually part of that. So all of this is actually part of Vertica. And as I mentioned, uh, it's coded from scratch in C++ in Vertica to be uh, able to run at really fast speeds um, and be very uh, scalable uh, across all the nodes in the cluster. A uh, quick example here. Uh, I just want to leave some time towards the end for question and answer. So uh, yeah, uh, so SQL, uh, as I mentioned, is one interface that you have as an option. Other is uh, Vertica Pi. Uh, so what Vertica Pi is, uh, it, it is an application that you can install on the client side. Uh, it, it defines virtual data frames on top of uh, tables uh, or views that you have in a Vertica data warehouse. And uh, here it's just showing one, uh, showing one node, but uh, there might be a lot of uh, nodes in that cluster. Uh, now you can connect through Vertica Python, which is uh, our uh, library uh, for Python connection or the generic ODBC, JDBC, uh, and be able to operate on that data. Now, the benefits, um, there, there's a lot of them, uh, but the biggest one is that you get the familiar interface uh, of Python, which uh, a lot of data scientists seem to like, uh, but you get all the processing power of Vertica. So what that means is you're not limited by the amount of memory uh, on a single machine or on a cluster because Vertica uh, can do in disk, uh, disk based processing. So, you know, um, essentially uh, it's uh, pretty much unlimited in uh, the amount of resources it can have. Uh, it can automatically push all that processing uh, to Vertica and parallelize it on all the nodes. So you don't have to uh, configure how many number of threads or CPU cycles it needs to uh, take. Um, and um, there's a lot of uh, additional uh, benefits from Python side in terms of its flexibility. Like uh, let's say you want to uh, write some iterations. Uh, so all of those benefits come from, from that um, site. Uh, and uh, the library itself is open source. You can download it and you can go look at the code uh, and uh, contribute as well if uh, that's something you like. Um, continuing that example, uh, so let's say I'm uh, a, a user that is uh, Vertica Pi installed on my Mac or PC or, or some other machine. Uh, so um, let's say I'm using Jupyter Notebook. So this is uh, the script that I, uh, want, uh, I would write to do some summary statistics on my data. Now, Iris is um, a small data set, uh, which is pretty popular, uh, but just um, here for uh, explaining the process. So what Vertica Pi would do in the backend is actually convert that into SQL script. Um, and you don't have to define the number of columns or you know, um, any variables in that. Uh, a lot of that is um, abstraction uh, is performed by this Vertica Pi library in the backend. Uh, now, once that has been converted, this SQL code is actually sent to Vertica uh, for distributed execution. Uh, now, this is a simple uh, statistics function, which is sort of easy uh, to uh, think about. But let's say you were building a random forest classification algorithm uh, in Vertica. So what this means is that when once that SQL code is pushed down to Vertica, uh, Vertica actually stores that, that model and hosts that uh, in the data warehouse. So the next time you want to make some predictions on it, or let's say do some model evaluations, that data um, model actually is stored in the data warehouse. So that's where, uh, uh, you know, this a SQL processing engine plus that storage layer benefit actually really kicks in. So what do you get on the client side uh, is uh, some really nice results in terms of output of uh, some statistics, what is the count, uh, uniqueness, top percentile, and some other statistics around that. Um, again, uh, there's a whole lot of analytics that are supported uh, through this uh, uh, library and this approach. Um, and you can uh, have a look at them uh, in, in the doc link uh, on top or uh, just go to GitHub and download it. Uh, PIP is also supported for this. Uh, so benefits of uh, using uh, Vertica for machine learning, it's an enterprise grade infrastructure. So you get the support that you need um, and uh, we keep on improving the product. There's security that comes standard with it. Uh, Vertica supports conference sessions uh, and you don't really need to do a lot of uh, uh, stuff manually to make that happen. Uh, a lot of that is taken care of by Vertica. And again, you know, if you want uh, um, to add more users or add more uh, queries that are powering some up some dashboards or some applications. It's just as easy as, as just defining those routines and uh, putting them uh, to work again. MS, ML is really fast and scalable um, and you can use uh, the familiar SQL interface or Python if uh, that's what you prefer or one of the other three languages to uh, build your own algorithms, which is Java, C++ and R. So uh, want to know more. Uh, here are the links again, uh, which you can use uh, to know more. And 
Uh, Vertica actually has a community edition, which you can download and it's free up to uh, three nodes and one terabyte. And it can be really helpful if you're trying to explore some of this functionality. Um, so yeah, I hope uh, it helped uh, you understand uh, some uh, some about Vertica. And yeah, back to Mary D. <clears throat> well, thank you. Thank you to, to both of you. Um, and we will now go to Q&A. So let me remind people that <clears throat> if you have a question, go ahead and put it into the Q&A section there. I keep calling it a box. Steve calls it a panel. I'm not sure what you call it. Anyway, um, <clears throat> uh, this, we do have a question here about frameworks. I think this is probably directed at you, John, since I think this came in while you were talking. Um, how do you see frameworks such as Zachman or TOGAF used in this type of approach. And then there was another thing that got added in here about maybe you should consider TKS. So, okay. Um, John, what do you think? Yeah, no, good questions. Um, and I think one of them was from uh, Michael uh, Cezino. Yeah. So great to hear from him again. Um, very knowledgeable in that space. Uh, so hats off to Michael. Um, so yes, I, I, I think that for me personally, I, I do embrace Zachman and, and Togaf and things like that because they help with defining the framework of the architecture well. Um, I think the challenge is that people can come up with these target state or these vision architectures, but um, they very quickly get lost in how do I build this? Right. It, it's like I, I've got this, you know, uh, four story apartment building to build, you know, where do I start? And so, you know, it, the focus for us mostly, uh, you know, those frameworks are used in conjunction with our modern data architecture and integration architectures. And and they include that. So, you know, there's the, they're factored in their capabilities address. You know, if you're related back to Zachman is really about, um, you know, the who and the why parts of things. Um, so we, we are very balanced in the architecture. And, but we just found that a lot of companies struggle and, and um, get overwhelmed, especially when you throw cloud on top of that. Um, it's one thing to do this on-prem with all your existing technologies. Um, and we do you know, assessments all the time like that. But when they say, hey, we're doing a cloud migration strategy and we wanna modernize at the same time, and we can say, yeah, this is what an ideal architecture should look like. And I, I shared a quick you know, snapshot of that. Yeah. They're, they're very quickly, where do we stop? start? Which piece do we move first? And, and so we're trying to help companies um, come up with a methodology that helps them deploy architecture in their agile you know, development environments. And, and these are the things that we find that take this component, this component, and, and, and include that into your daily working structure, your daily standups, your agile reporting metrics, all of that you know, architecture can't be seen as this one-off on the side. It needs to be there right alongside developers, learning from developers, watching what they're doing, refactoring that back into architecture patterns in every one of those from modern data warehouses to machine learning projects. You know, the, the, what you're saying there seems to also tie in with, with a comment you made in your presentation about <clears throat> the tendency to over-engineer. Yeah. And, and we, we, your analogy of the four-story uh, building, I'm thinking, yeah, there's going to be somebody on that team who says, let's start with the interior decoration. Yes. What kind of paint do we want to use on yeah. the walls? That have Why don't we see who's coming in the door first and how many people we have in a lobby before we worry about that? Um, I, I'm an architect, so I, I can relate to that. I've done it before, um, you know, and, and but I, I think that, you know, delivering the value to the business is, is going to be that key and that needs to be your driver and thinking about capabilities. Um, and, you know, I, I don't believe that coming up with a... Uh, a cloud hybrid multi-cloud architecture with a mix of the right technologies and every company will custom tailor it to their environments and their needs a little bit. That's not the hard part. Um, defining it is not the hard part. Getting there is the hard part. And what will happen is companies will continue to just do whatever they have to to get it going because architecture can't get off the ground. They're, mm -hmm. they're not agile. Um, <laughs> And, and that's what's got to change. And, and just our mindset about uh, how we think of architecture. It's not a, a five-year plan. 
it's an ongoing everyday job to be an architect, um, to evaluate technologies, to look for patterns. Um, and our goal is to always make the platform add more value, be faster for developers to use. You know, we're building, you know, our job is to create something that um, enables all of these agile delivery teams to do their projects. That's what an architect should be doing, yeah. you know, creating an environment for them. So um, we can get stuck um, if we're not careful. And, and architect teams, you know, they, they have it rough at companies. I, I've been in, I've sat with them and, and, and you know, helped them quite often. So that methodology is really the key, especially it's been compounded and, and just slammed in its tracks for cloud migrations. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, Kaz, do you have <clears throat> comments on frameworks or over engineering? <laughs> yeah, I, I'd leave that to John. I think uh, that's his uh, area of expertise. Yeah. And this is where, you know, the, you know, the machine learning, you know, teams and, and you know, like uh, um, what Kaz is, you know, talking about, he would love to have a platform where the data is all in one place in a data lake. Vertica is great. <laughs> at this being a, a, a native columnar format and compression. And when you get into the machine learning world, and if you're an architect, you understand they deal with ultra wide tables. Uh, they call things on column basis. They're not dealing with the flip side of dealing with streaming data ingestion of row based data, right? You know, in a data architecture, you need to understand those things so that products like Vertica are put in positions to be successful and really shine on key projects. Um, the, in our architecture, also the uh, self-service data analytic workbenches or, or mm -hmm. sandboxes. Vertica is great for spinning those up for uh, customers very easily. They have both, the, uh, Vertica has their, their cloud native approach versus you know, their on-prem standard approach. So you can bridge the hybrid environments or run in the cloud as IaaS if you want. But you know, there needs to be a process and a mindset and training that, hey, as a team, we need to explore data to figure out this project we need to deliver. Um, how can we build it if we have we can't even play with data and we're not, not just in depth? Give business analysts to Vertica, you know, environments and schema where they can pull in data easily, do their analysis, do their discovery. In, in Vertica, we always recommend a strong columnar MPP technology in that component. Um, Vertica fits that bill. It's always on that short list. And, um, that enables them. It enables the data scientists in the transition, and then you know data management teams can come in and change that later. So yeah, I think uh, when you're uh, thinking about architecture, two really important considerations is one: you want uh, whatever tool you're selecting within that architecture, you know, each component, it should enable you to do what you want to do with your data. So if you are thinking about uh, large sets of data, it should be able to handle that data. And as I mentioned, it's not just about storage; it's about it's about getting value out of that data through analytics. It can be machine learning or some forecasting models, it can be some simpler analytics. So that's the tool in itself. The second thing is that how well the tool connects with the other elements in your architecture, and that's not just today, but in the future as well. As John mentioned, it's it, it, you know a certain architecture might be a good fit for you today, it might not be a good fit for you tomorrow. So let's say you are thinking about a cloud technology. So you know vendor lock-in can become a really big problem for you six months or one year from now. So what you ideally want to do is pick up a component, especially such a you know a critical component in your architecture, which does uh, storage and uh, all of the analytics of your data, to be one that allows you that sort of flexibility in terms of connectivity with different tools, in terms of choices, whether it's hybrid, on-prem, or different cloud architectures. So let's say uh, Amazon, for example, works for um, a certain customer or a certain user today, and their architecture uh, fits that build today. But for some reason, it doesn't work tomorrow. So they want to move on to Google or Microsoft or some other architecture. Uh, those tools should not be uh, you know, stopping you from moving there. Uh, it should be enabling you to do that, actually. And you should have that ease and freedom. Yeah, so within the architecture, one of the requirements we carry is a category called portability, uh, open architecture. And it does drive cloud native decisions, like what Koss is saying, that you know, if you go in to, let's say, start writing a lot of AMDA, you know, uh, AWS uh, Lambda functions, portability there is a little different versus containers, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I would say that a lot of companies that look at a lift and shift, you know, it depends on what you're lift and shifting from on-prem to get into the cloud. But lift and re-platform um, does make sense quite often because you're probably on-prem in a database or a data warehouse that has not been performing and has been painful for some time already. It's part of your initiative to take advantage of additional resources and something going from a 
a SQL relational database to a better analytics optimized SQL relational database in the cloud to re-platform in the process is not such a leap. And, and sometimes those make more sense. Um, and, and you have to sort that out across the board. And I think what, what Kass is saying is that, you know, you, you don't always know um, what the future holds. So today, if you're in, in Amazon, great. And tomorrow you need to be in Azure or you buy a company or, you know, merge with a company and they're in Azure and you've got assets. Portability becomes a big key um, in technologies that are able to ab abstract above the cloud, you know, is a decision as part of the strategy you, you need to be making, but you have to be agile in that and, and, and minimize rework all the time. What cost? Yeah, I, I'm curious when we're talking about portability and when we're talking about agile, how, how much has the landscape changed since March? Are you seeing in, in customers added um, I added uh, interest in cloud or has it pretty much stayed the same? Yeah, so um, I would say there are a lot of changes that have happened since March and in terms of uh, um, cloud or preferability for that, you know, preference for that in general, it lets you scale your workloads and you know, a lot of the IT systems are having a lot of uh, workloads uh, these mm -hmm. days. Uh, that's an important component. So, you know, getting that from scalability from there, that that's definitely important. Uh, versus, you know, on-prem solution, which might be a little harder. But again, I think the focus in terms of the solution itself, not just the architecture, is a solution that can scale. Um, you cannot just, you know, stick with one uh, solution, which just, you know, requires you to add a certain hardware, which lets you go up to a certain mm -hmm. limit, and then you have to upgrade that hardware. That's sort of a model where you would, you know, spend six months to a year uh, planning that sort of architecture and deciding that, and then going for another architecture. So you don't have that uh, uh, leverage or that sort of, uh, you know, right. Yeah. freedom anymore. You need yeah. to pick the right things from the start, um, at least um, that are scalable. And again, as I mentioned, if um, those components uh, allow you to have that uh, sort of a freedom and that sort of, uh, you know, uh, uh, portability as John uh, used the word, uh, that that's all that matters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I will add on Mary D that what we have seen is uh, since March, a lot of companies have gone into you know, uh, freezing projects, being conservative, watching expenses. Mm. And sometimes there is a high level reaction that it's accelerating cloud migration projects because they view it as a cost savings cost measure. Savings, yeah. We can run cheaper. Hey, let's do that. We, we need to make some investments. We've been talking about it for a while. And they are saying, hey, we're going to move our, our you know, on-prem systems and start taking you know, advantage of lower cost and, and, and efficiencies in the cloud, which is fine um, if, if that's the one that pushes them over the edge this year. But the challenge is that within the first year, we just see companies hit the wall where we're in over our head. This is harder than we thought. Oh, oh. The services, the orchestration, the security, with VPCs, you know, they're like, we used to just build our, our data warehouses and have our database and our ETL server. And, you know, uh, our biggest decisions were ELT. Now we've got hundreds of services, orchestrations, decisions, and they get almost in this paralysis uh, phase where they take the first couple of steps. And with each step, it gets harder and harder. And so we have just found, you know, with a lot of our work in the strategy side, as well as the implementation side, um, that there is more of a reset in the expectations uh, with the business for yeah, this adoption. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have seen companies and, and helped them make that shift in six months with a lift and shift, but then they went into a refactoring phase for years. Yeah. Not ideal, but they got there because they needed to fast. But uh, a lot of companies are, kind of, or executives, let's say, you know, fall into the, hey, we could save a lot of costs. We looked at this, the cloud people have brought us a lot of numbers. Looks good, let's do it. And their teams, the skills, the experience, yeah. they're just not there. And, and they take investment and they take time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let me thank both John and Wakas for a very enlightening session here. Um, the video will be posted on YouTube to the DBTA channel. And John, somebody asked, if you were putting your slides somewhere? Um, I'm not putting them anywhere, but uh, if you email me directly, I, I think we can share those and send them out. Okay, very good, very good. And um, thanks again to both of you. Thanks to Sumo Logic, our diamond sponsor. 
and all of you come back in an hour for our next session of Data Summit Connect. Sure. Thank you. Thanks, Mary D. Thanks for Cos. Thanks, John. Thanks, John.